are people of God created to love. Stewardship campaign. That's a better way to start that up. We have been looking at the Good Samaritan. Um, it was the text that was preached from on last Sunday, the text that I will be preaching from today, and the text that Lester will preach from on next Sunday. Who knew that there was so much sermon in one text? But that's what the Bible does, right? You can read it so many times and find out new things every time you look at it. If you would please turn with me as you are able to Luke chapter 10. Uh, verses 25 through 37. It is a little lengthy, but it's well worth the entire text. It reads as follows, Just then a lawyer stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said to him, what is written in the law? What do you read there? The lawyer answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And he, the lawyer, said, or Jesus said to the lawyer, you have given the right answer. Do this and you will live. But wanting to justify himself, just like a lawyer, right? He asked Jesus, who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell into the hands of robbers who stripped him, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. Now, by chance, a priest was going down the same road. And when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. Likewise, a Levite, when he came to that place, saw him and passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan while traveling came near him. And when he saw him, he was moved with pity. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, having poured oil and wine on them. And then he put him on his own animal, brought him to an inn and took care of him. The next day, he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper and said, take care of him. And when I come back, I will repay you whatever more you spend. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers, Jesus asked. The lawyer said, the one who showed him mercy. Jesus said to him, go and do likewise. God, for this opportunity to share with your people the recipe for the bread of life for this moment, that you and I have created, I thank you. Asking, O oh God, that the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. God, thank you so very much for being our strength and our redeemer. It's in your name we pray, give thanks, and believe it to be so. Amen. 
James Oliver said to me, you got it. And I said, what? He said, Ray, you got it. And when you got it, you got it. James Oliver happened to be one of the other 13 that traveled with us as we were in the Middle East. And James happened to see me as we were walking along the streets of Casablanca, Morocco, passed by a barber shop. It was a small little barber shop, not very big at all. Uh, to the right sat just uh, maybe it was a friend of the client or a friend of the barber. He just sat there, you know, watching as we passed by. The client was in the chair and the barber was to the left. So we walked past and we're walking slowly and I kind of, you know, looked and looked again and it was interesting to me because the man in the chair wasn't getting his hair trimmed. He was getting it treated in some type of way. He had some, like a white chemical or something in his head and in my mind I'm thinking, is he going to walk away and it'll be curly? Like, what's going to happen here? I didn't know what was going on, but it intrigued me. So I asked if I, I made the, 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 um, action, I guess, with my fingers for a picture, and the guy nodded his head. So James saw me smiling at them and them smiling back at me, exchanging a smile for the sake of the picture. James happened to say to me, when you got it, you got it. He said, Ray, there's something about you that draws people in. And from his perspective, it was especially men at this point because that's the only people, Pam, who were in the barbershop. So I don't know if James thought that I was flirting or anything like that, but I didn't think any more about it. Nevertheless, the Samaritan had it. It drew him in. He used it. He gave it without question, without thinking twice about it. And the Samaritan, whom I'm assuming was a man, was not exchanging uh, smiles with hairstylists in Jerusalem. The priest and the Levite had it. But did they know it? As ministers, if they couldn't give anything tangible to this beaten up, downtrodden, half-dead man, they could have at least given him some hope through prayer. But they gave him nothing of use. They actually gave him a lessened sense of hope. And by, by chance, they could have also decreased his faith in God since the priest and the Levite were representatives of God, and they may have even decreased his faith in the good of humanity as this man, beaten, stripped, and left for dead, was laying there, and they passed him by. He was close to the point of no return, and the two people who could have potentially helped him passed him by knowingly yet with some sense of unintentional intentionality and even in that they added insult to the injuries that he already had. The hymn writer said, Savior, Savior, hear my humble cry. While on others thou art calling, please do not pass me by. And while the context of which that hymn was written could be different, such words still apply to this text. See here, the beaten up, downtrodden man was looking on Dave at this priest as he passed by and looking on as the, as, as the Levite passed by. And he was saying, I need a savior. I need somebody to hear my cry. I need somebody not to pass me by. I need somebody to help me. But the priest and the Levite could not hear him. Maybe the reason why they couldn't hear him has to do with the note that the HarperCollins Study Bible left in this particular part of the text, letting us know that there may have been a concern about impurity from being in contact with a corpse. But wouldn't you know that if your Bible reads like mine does, at the end of verse 30 it says, leaving him half dead and corpse if I'm not mistaken, are 100% dead, which means that if this man was only half dead, he had a 50% chance of life, and they had at least a 50% chance of helping him. But they passed him by. Why was it that they passed him by? Why was it that these church leaders, these men who represented God and represented church, were seemingly more concerned with the law more concerned with structure, more concerned with order 
than they were concerned with love. They had it, but they weren't drawn by it. And all things considered, maybe they didn't know how to use it at the time. Maybe they wanted to help but couldn't balance the scales between religion and law, which, mind you, was an Old Testament law. And here it is, we're well into the New Testament and love and their hearts. But the Samaritan had it. It drew him in. He used it. He gave it without question and without thinking twice. And even more, this beaten up, downtrodden, only half dead man was able to receive it. And Connie, the interesting thing is that Northwood has it too. And so Alice Faye, you have a look on your face that's saying to me, well, what is it? And I'm glad you asked. It just happens to be compassion. What this text refers to as pity. It's the same kind of compassion that Jesus had on the widow who was about to bury her only son in Luke chapter 7, verses 11 through 17. It's the same compassion that Jesus had when he saw Mary and Martha and how their brother's death affected them in John 11 and 33. This compassion, this compassion, this compassion known as pity in this text is not necessarily a matter of us feeling sorry for someone more along the lines of empathy when we ourselves are able to relate to what someone else is experiencing, to what they're feeling, to what it is that they're going through. And we know about that kind of compassion. It's the reason why for the past two years that we've been able to receive a certificate that says, Northwood, you have expressed your compassion in giving, and you're in this top five category in, in statistics of giving to the Disciples Mission Fund and to special day offerings. That's just not for naught because the offering uh, envelopes happen to be a different color and we make mention of it during the day. We could absolutely have these different colored offering envelopes and make mention of it and you could keep your hands and your pocketbooks closed. But there's a reason why you give because you have it. You have that compassion. And we have the opportunity to be able to give to our neighbors. That's what that empathy was about. That's what that compassion that the Samaritan showed was about. But what if I told you that we are our own neighbors? And I don't just mean the people that live next to you or the person across the aisle, but we within this congregation as a whole are our own neighbors. Yes, we as a church are neighbors to the community, but we're also neighbors to each other. How and why? Because neighbors care about each other. Neighbors care about the people in their community. Neighbors care about what happens to the community. And I know we know uh, that we care about what happens inside and outside of these walls. If a member is sick and we have not seen them for a while, we call. We send cards. We say prayers. We might even drop by with a dish or two. Sue Blunk happens to meticulously tend our grounds, which means that she recognizes as a neighbor that she care, we recognize that she cares about the grounds or the outside of this church. We care about our visitors and we want them to feel welcome when they come in. Hence the reason why Sheila happens to stand out in the vestibule with her bulletins in hand and a smile across her face and even more reason why the passing of the peace happens to take so long. Because we want to make sure that everyone is welcomed. And surely these are not all the ways or all the people around this neighborhood who express such compassion. The best way to do so is through that love and through that care, through the welcome. So you may not have everything that the Samaritan had. You might not have the oil and the wine, and you might not have the donkey and the denarii, and you might not have the bandages. But maybe, Margaret, you only have the oil and I have the wine. And maybe, Francis, you're the one that has the denarii. And then, Jan, maybe you're the one that has the donkey to put the man up on. And somebody else has, has the, the bandages so that we can make sure that this man gets healed. So who is this man? 
It's the world at large. And even if we don't all have everything, at least we each have piece by piece so that we can pool our resources to help. The best example that I have for this is a very recent example. I attended again a conference in Chicago uh, called the World Changers Summit. And on last night, the ending, the service, the ending service, the pastor got up. He said, every year we raise an offering. He said, we raise an offering for the sake of being able to purchase land for ministry. He said, we've purchased every building that we've owned debt free. They purchased it outright. He said the Lord had, was dealing with him about children and laid it upon his heart to be able to open up a space, to purchase a space for children. And anybody who knows Chicago knows that it's not always the greatest place when it comes to lives, period, but especially young lives. So for him to have this, to feel this burden, uh, to be able to have a place for the children was exceptional. He said, I am about to raise $240,000 in 10 minutes. He said he talked to a friend of his that said it couldn't be done, and he told him, watch. So he called his wife up. He and his wife had a particular amount that they were given, and he said, anybody who's able to give $1,000, if you would please stand. So people started to stand, and there were two women in, sitting in front of me, and they turned around, and they said, would you like to give with us? I said, well, what is it? Help me understand what this is that you're doing. So in years past, what would happen is if everybody, if one person didn't have a thousand, what they would do was collectively come together and, and just try to make as close as they could. Well, our section, I am proud to say, we were able to collectively give $1,076. The flip side of that is that there was a woman that walked across the aisle that had a $2,000 check in her hand. Another group was able to come up with $1,700, and another group was able to come up with $1,200 and $1,500. And I guarantee you that in that 10-minute time frame, we probably exceeded that amount. Why? Because it wasn't a matter of, oh, I only have $20 and I can't give, but I put my money with someone else's money, and they put that money with somebody else's money, and we were able to pool our resources. The compassion that the pastor had for the children reached out into that congregation. It reached us. And we were able to show it by way of what we gave. So that's what we have the opportunity to do. To be able to pool our resources no matter how much or no matter how big. Because it's a matter of us doing it from our hearts. It's a matter of us doing it cheerfully, knowing that God is still in the two fish and five loaves feeding 5,000 blessing business. So my suggestion and request of you is that as you prepare your hearts and minds to fill out that pledge card on next Sunday, that you think on these things. Think on the fact that you have it and that you can use it and that you can give it without question and without thinking twice about it. It's compassion, and we can give it to help be a blessing to this world. Thanks be to God. God, it is indeed that we heed your summon and answer, here are we. We ask, O oh God, that you would send us upon your errand and let us, we, your servants, be. We ask, God, that you would take us and make us holy Teach us your will and way. Speak and behold, we answer. Command and we obey. As we leave this place, but never from your presence, may your grace, the sweet communion of your Holy Spirit, rest, rule, and abide with each of us until we meet again and as we go and do the same. It's in your name that we pray, give thanks, and believe it to be so. Amen. <laughs>